I make a new assumption I have a cold. Okay, I'm turning it on to make sure it works. And we've got a microphone here. We will see if people see that we're online. And if you see whether we're online, let us know that you hear me. We will start yeah, class soon. It's just, yeah, that's, I think that's right. Look at that. We're online. We're online. Where's my head? That's a grand You thing. can't see your head, but you can see my head. So oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So everybody enjoy the view of Adam's head. Adam's head is one of our best features. I'm going to see if anybody else is making their way in. Yeah, yeah. No. Ooh. Have you, have you been right most of the time? I love that. I love that. What I love to hear is the feedback of how people are using that devotional book. Because people have a different way of doing it. Well, I'm really glad of that. That's great to hear. That is great to hear. It's It's... There was one that made me cry. Who wrote it, though? Uh, Mother Anne. Okay. She's good at making people cry. <laughs> one of her spiritual gifts. <laughs> well, this is always, this is a little imposing, isn't it? So I, I love these classes where I'm teaching about, you know, sacramentality or something, and there are four or five clergy in the room. Like, you all know this stuff. And like, I'll, I'm sure I will get things wrong. So, so this this class, and we'll have people coming in, I'm sure, as they get their pie or get their pizza or whatever. You're not going to be talking about the sin of gluttony, are you? The sin of gluttony? How many pieces of pie do you have? Two. You're just just under the wire. You're 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 good. Yeah, I saw yours, <laughs> but I wasn't going to say anything. I love the one. I understand that. No, no complaints here. So th this is, what, the fourth class? I think it's the fourth class in this series on um, breaking bread. Uh, the, the, the Passover and the Jewish seders and the scriptural witness about the Last Supper. Last week, and I have to admit, I did not, I wasn't here. So I didn't see it, and I didn't go back to, to watch. But uh, Deacon Bruce taught about the first, <clears throat> the first part of the, Eucharistic liturgy, at least I hope that's what he did. That was kind of the, the intention. Um, and this, this is presented as an instructed Eucharist, um, you know, actually doing Eucharist. But we're not going to do that because we just did Eucharist. And as far as I was, uh, what I was planning to do with this session, we're not doing a full celebration. There is no liturgy of the word at this point, And you have to have the liturgy of the word to have a, you have to have a gospel reading, at least, to have a celebration of Eucharist. So we're not going to actually have Eucharist. We're going to talk about the Eucharist um, rather than, than actually celebrating it. And, and how, many, how many of you were here for the, the session two weeks ago about the Seder meal? There's, there's some of us here for that. Okay, cool. That's good. Because at least as the class was designed, this is intended to draw some parallels and connections between the Seder and the Last Supper and the celebration of Eucharist as we know it. So I wanted to, to read something from um, one, one of the many Passover Haggadah's uh, instructions about, about how to do a Seder, because I thought this was a great um, encapsulation, both of what the Seder is intended to be doing and... Um, I think there's some resonances for us in celebrating Eucharist too. So it says, The Seder marks the Israelites' liberation and recounts, commemorates, and celebrates the story of their exodus led by Moses to freedom and to the promised land. Each generation is called to imagine themselves as if they personally experienced this. And so the holiday celebrates not only the historical liberation, but also the ongoing desire to remain spiritually, politically, and emotionally free. So what grabbed me there was the, the line that each generation is called to imagine themselves as if they personally experienced this. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Here, let me, let me shut the door. 
I'm sorry, you think what? I think he talked about that. In the videos, you mean? From the Seder. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But I mean, in terms of anything we do as Christians, does that sound familiar? Anamnesis. Always nice to have clergy plants yeah. at the table. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. Right, it's this wonderful Greek word that we don't really, I don't think, we have a great... Um, translation for, a really effective translation in English, but it means active remembering. Like, not to remember something like, I remember what my address is, or I remember, you know, some, 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 some fact that I might bring to mind, but remembering that brings the past into the present moment. Yeah. The, like, living memory. Yeah, reliving it. Exactly, reliving it. And, except maybe living it anew. I mean, you could look at it that way, too. It's not just, like I said, not just the historical moment that we kind of bring in and remember, but we take that historical thing, that thing from the past, and bring it into the current reality. So it's probably a little different than, not probably, it is a little different than it would have been originally, but it's still alive and still real. Oh, oh, so I didn't, I didn't say this. When... Because we are using a different bit of technology, this is our microscopic um, uh, yes. microphone, so we'll pass that around as we talk. Well, for me, it's like, I was seven years old, we lived on a farm, and we had a huge lilac bush. Loved yeah, okay. And I would love to smell it. Every time I smell lilacs, I'm seven years old again in that <laughs> Yes. No, right. Does, any, does that resonate for anybody else? That kind of a memory? I have I have a similar memory about breadsticks in Italy. There's a certain kind of breadstick that when I bite into it, suddenly I'm at a table in Italy, you know, which is pretty nice and cheap um, compared with airline tickets. So that's good. Do we need? Oh, there are more chairs over there. Okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, anamnesis is that 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 bringing of the past into the present moment. Um, so so. As folks are doing a Seder, they're, I think it's fair to say, they're experiencing God's action in that, in that moment. And I think it would be true um, of the Eucharist as well. I mean, that's what we would teach, that we're in the Eucharist experiencing God's action, God's work, Jesus' work particularly, in that moment. So we're going to go through, let me hand this out, we're going to go through <clears throat> the Eucharistic prayer um, to, to look at what, what it contains. And as we go through, the, the, some of this is just kind of interesting, I think, to, to, to note what, what goes into a Eucharistic prayer. Um, there, there are components of it that tend to be common across all the different forms of the Eucharistic prayer. But what, what we're going to look at at the end is what work is God doing here, right? So in the Seder, you know, it's this active remembrance of God's deliverance of the people from Egypt, of, of free, freedom from bondage and uh, crossing the Red Sea and liberation, you know. So that's, that's God's work that the Seder is bringing into current memory. So let's think about what we're bringing into living memory when we do Eucharist. So if you would take one of those and pass it around... This is, this is just, not just, no mere thing. This, this is right out of the prayer book, but I thought it was easier, honestly, than carting over 25 prayer books. And I didn't know if we had prayer books over here, so I just went ahead and printed some copies, and I'm sorry to the trees for having done that, but I did. Um, but, but this is Eucharistic Prayer A, which is the prayer we're currently using. There's no magic to that. It's just what we're currently using, and I thought that would be easy um, easy to, to, to do because we kind of have it in our heads right now. Um, so we'll go through and, and look at the different pieces of it. So it starts, as you might remember, um, the, the Lord be with you, and also you know, lift up your hearts, right? So this is called the Sursum Corda, which is a great Latin uh, phrase that simply means lift up your hearts. So no great magic to that, but but it's it, you know it's it's the line itself. So that's 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 its name, but but it's I think its purpose is is gathering, right? It's it's to remind us here we are. We're offering ourselves. We're offering our God. Uh, offering our hearts 
in, uh, in thanksgiving. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And, and that, it's just, just that phrase is worth noting too. You see at the top of the page, this is called the Great Thanksgiving. That's what Eucharist means. It's a Greek word for thanksgiving. So every time we celebrate Eucharist, we're celebrating our Thanksgiving meal, which I love that. Uh, we don't have turkey, but it's still a Thanksgiving meal. So Sursum Corda is how all, all these prayers begin. Then it goes into, um, it is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Um, and it says there in italics, a, here a proper, a proper preface is sung or said on all Sundays. And the, what's below there is the proper preface for Lent. So this is the preface. The preface, as it would be in a book, is the part that comes first, right? <laughs> it's kind of what sets something up. So this is setting up the rest of the Eucharistic prayer. And it's couching it um, in, in, a, in terms of a particular season or a particular event. So like if it were the celebration of an, uh, an apostle or a martyr or something like that, there'd be a, a proper preface related to apostolicity or martyrdom or those things. The, the one that's here is one of the two options for the proper preface for Lent. So since we're in Lent, that's what's there. Um, so it's always a good thing to give thanks to you, for you bid your faithful people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for Easter. So it's just kind of rooting the prayer in the moment in which we're living, reminding us, okay, it's, it's Lent. And therefore, because of all of that, and, and all the prefaces end this way, therefore we praise you and, pro and join our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn. And then we have the Sanctus, which is just holy. That's the word uh, in Latin. Sanctus. Sanctus. S-A-N-C-T-U-S. Um, and this is common across all the Eucharistic prayers too. It, it contains this wonderful word, Hosanna. Anybody know what Hosanna actually means? Something really high? <laughs> Hosanna in the highest. Oh, okay, yes, something really high. That's it. It means save. And in fact, it's like save with an exclamation point. Save now. Darn it. Yeah. Come save us. It, it's a Hebrew word. Um, yeah, that just it means save. Save us. Come save. Which is interesting tangent, but, you know, this it comes, of course, well, it comes out of the Old Testament first, but we, we think of it as what the crowds are saying as they're welcoming Jesus on Palm Sunday. So it's not just praise, it's it's not just, oh, Hosanna, we love you, it's save us. Yeah, that's a different Yeah, it's a little, little more of a political message, perhaps, than we might typically ascribe to the Sanctus, um, at least in that moment it was. Anyway, so there's the Sanctus. And then it goes, the next section there is called, <clears throat> excuse me, well, it's a recap of salvation history. So each of the prayers has a paragraph or so that couches Jesus' action, Jesus' ministry in the world, and Jesus' sovereignty over the world in a broader picture. So it goes back, it goes back to the beginning. And, and these, I mean, they're fabulous. It's Two sentences in this case, um, encapsulating all of salvation history, all of God's work um, with humanity. You know, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. So go all the way back to creation. When we fell into sin, you and your mercy sent Jesus, your Son, to share our nature. So, you know, all these wonderful uh, truths about uh, and uh, doctrines of the, the, uh, Christianity, incarnation, creation just kind of get named in the, in the rehearsal of salvation history there. Um, and, and they all bring that history into kind of focus in Jesus' ministry, in Jesus' presence. And in this case, in prayer A, takes us to the cross um, and, and kind of brings the story to a, to a moment, at least a moment's um, <coughs> conclusion um, in, in the crucifixion. So... Go on to the next page. The next section, what we have in all these Eucharistic prayers, is called the Narrative of the Institution. 
which is not institution like in the sense of an institution of you know higher learning or something, but the narrative of the institution of the Lord's Supper. And we'll look at this language um, later in Scripture, but it's 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 telling the story. And like I say, each of the each of the prayers basically tells the story this same way. And interestingly, there are there are forms of the Eucharistic prayer in even in the prayer book um, that are sort of a create your own version. Um, you know, the celebrant now rehearses salvation history. The celebrant now offers God praise for you know doesn't give you script, but it does give you script for this. <laughs> this is what you're supposed to say um, when it comes to the narrative of the institution. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. There's that word. Not just remembrance here, but remembrance like that you could hold on to. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And again, whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance, the bringing back together to remember something. Whenever you drink it, do it for the remembrance of me. So that's the story. There's the, the story of the institution of the Eucharist. And we respond to that with what's called the memorial acclamation. Um, where we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Um, and that's, that's actually from, or at least hearkening to, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Um, and, and actually, this language, we, if, we were, if we had more time, we'd look at this too, but um, the language in the prayer book is closer to what's in 1 Corinthians than closer to what's in the Gospels. But Paul describes what he received and what he's passing on to the folks in Corinth um, in language that kind of becomes that narrative of the institution. And then he says at the end of that, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Which has always struck me as a weird thing to say, right? That, that's what we're remembering? Why would that, why do you, why would that be? Because we do that in the, in the memorial acclamation. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So we're remembering not just his presence among us, but remembering how that happened, right? I, maybe that. Why, why do you think that's there? Because it says, and die as one of us to reconcile us. There you go. So therefore, let's draw us to him. Nice. That without the death, the reconciliation doesn't happen. I mean, and there's a whole mystery we could explore for a long, long time. But, but I think that would be Christian teaching. Yeah, that Jesus' death is a God's reconciling act. No, that's great. Nicely done. Um, okay. So from that, <clears throat> at least in this prayer, and, the, and these elements you know, move around from one Eucharistic prayer to another, but in prayer A, we move then to the oblation, which just means an offering, to offer something. So we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling what we just recalled, his death and resurrection. We offer you these gifts. So this is what, this is what the community has brought. And we're pretending that I have wine in here. I didn't want to waste the wine. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, I, that's, we could have just pretended to have Eucharist and passed it around, yeah. But it's, it's the community, they're, they're symbols, signs, rather, of the community's gifts. That this bread and wine is of the earth and of our hands and of our pockets and from our bread baskets or whatever it comes from. But it's, it's, it's the community's work that's brought this together. And then comes the epiclesis, which is a great word, great Greek word, which means an invocation of the Holy Spirit. So we say, sanctify them, this, these gifts, by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. So if you're looking, if you're somebody who likes to analyze things um, and wants to know when the magic happens, you know, that's sort of 
always a, it's, it's something seminarians like to argue about. I don't know, probably other people like to argue about it, but especially seminarians like to argue about it. When, you know, when, when does this become not bread? When the bells ring. There's an answer. Yeah, okay. Ring. That, that, that's, that's one. When we say amen. When we say amen. That, that's a good one. communities part of that. Yeah, and it's, the, and it's the only point in the prayer book uh, where the Amen is in all caps, interestingly. It should be in bold face and with stars and, you know, all kinds of things. Because it's, yeah. You could also, and I've heard people say this, make a case that it's, it's actually at the end of the Lord's Prayer. That the Lord's Prayer, which always follows what we see as the Eucharistic Prayer, is actually the end of the Eucharistic Prayer. So this isn't finished until the Lord's Prayer is said. Okay. I had a professor in seminary who I just really think would have argued that the moment of consecration is the narrative of the institution. Because he would go on and, you know, I just, I love this. If you've heard this before, I'm sorry, but I just love it. You know, he would be reading the prayer. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will and goes on into the narrative of the institution. Our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat this is my body, which is given for you. And he would just go on like that. So there was this very dramatic moment of body and blood. And you could just, you know, see the, um, I don't know. Anyway, that clearly that's where he thought the Holy Spirit was coming down, regardless of where the epiclesis comes. Um, anyway, so you can wonder about when consecration actually happens. But I kind of think it's the end of the prayer. That's that's where I would put it. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things about the prayers, though, is all the prayers except one has this order. Yeah. Words of institution, epiclesis, in that order. Right. And there's lots of debate about, of course, there's lots of debate about that, especially with the orthodoxy, because the way you proceed versus the moves it. Yeah, yeah. Right. And probably other Eucharistic prayers from other traditions do that too, but I don't actually know. So, okay, so we have, we have the Holy Spirit being invoked over the gifts of bread and wine, which at least some people would argue would, would make these the body and blood of Christ. So something's happening. Excuse me. <coughs> but something is happening in the next sentence too. So it says, sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of your Son. Then it says, sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity and constancy and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. What's happening there? Say it. Oh, nice catch. Ooh, nice. The, theosis, the, yeah, theosis or divinization. Well, up oh, here, here. Explain what you're meaning about that. Well, I mean, it's just what the church does sanctify us also. I mean, but in the Orthodoxy in particular, there's this idea that the outcome of the practice of the Christian faith is that we become as Christ is and as God is. So Christ became man so that man could become God. And even if you don't go quite as far as the Orthodox would, although I kind of would, but even if you don't go as far as the Orthodox would, I think you could absolutely say we are being brought together into the body of Christ. We are being brought together as the body of Christ in that moment. Being in Christ. Being in Christed, yes, right. Thank you. So sanctify us. Which is something I, I don't know, maybe you all pay more attention to it, but I, but I, I kind of think it's a throwaway line a lot of the time. And we're like, sanctify us, yeah, okay, let's <laughs> get on to the next thing, you know. But it's actually huge that we're asking God to make us or remind us or remember us into the body of Christ each time we pray that prayer, which is really cool, I think. And easy for us to let go of, especially in a culture where we're all about the individual, 
We're all about, you know, the, the sacred me <laughs> as opposed to the sacred us, you know. So that, I think that's important to pay attention to. Um, and then it ends with a, a concluding doxology. All this we ask through your son, Jesus, by him and with him and in him and the unity of the Holy Spirit. It, all honor and glory is yours. And then goes into the Lord's Prayer, which follows each of these, each of the Eucharist, Eucharistic prayers. And, and um, is, is why some folks would say that's where the consecration happens, is once you get to the end of that. But whatever, it doesn't really make that much difference. So what is going on there, do you think? Back to the original question. What, what, what's God doing in that prayer? I think there are more than, there's more than one thing, you know, that God's doing there. But what, what's, the, what's the action that, that happens through the work of the community offering that prayer? What are some examples? I, I have only a limited exposure to some people. I masses in your brain, but in all the Eucharist services I've ever been, they kind of come across to me as a little dour. So I get the impression that you're saying there's a lot of joy here. I, I, I think I would say that, yes, absolutely. I don't know if we, when we're doing it, put the joy in it. Mm. That's a pretty great point. That's what he and I were talking about in the pie line. The holy, the holy pie line. And I said it's a celebration. It is a celebration. It is a great Thanksgiving. And typically you don't, you know, adopt your most somber pose for th saying thank you. Thank you, God. You know, I mean, I'm so I'm so grateful. The Eeyore mass, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you can be joyous and solemn at the same time, but not not dour. Yeah, no. So what 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 other or what what work do you think is going on there? What's God doing? I think he's remembering. Yeah. Putting us back together. Nice. We've been dismembered. Now we're being remembered. As as Christ's body in the world, right? And just to say it really obviously, that's also what's happening in in the elements here, and is that Jesus is being remembered, brought back into living memory, because we would say that this is not simply a symbol, right? You know, there are there are Traditions in Christianity would certainly say the bread and the wine are nice symbols. There are memorials of Jesus' presence, but it's just a memorial, right? Now, we would say this is Jesus' real presence, or it would be if we'd actually prayed the prayer, um, which is not the same as transubstantiation. That's another exploration to go down. But, um, but, but that although this is bread, and if you put it under the microscope or you know, ran the test or whatever, you would see that it is actually bread and only bread, but it's not bread and only bread. It contains the real presence of Christ. In fairness to the clergy of St. Andrews, when I do go to the Eucharist, I always hear draw a smile from the clergy often. Maybe I would be proud. Well, that, I'm glad of that. <laughs> I, I have been told, actually, that we should smile more as we stand behind the altar. So it, it probably is a good corrective. Um, what, what else? Anything else? Um, anything else that strikes you that God's doing through this meal, through this celebration? Nourishing us spiritually. Nourishing us spiritually? Yeah, absolutely. So, like empowering us to go out and be the body of Christ in the world? Yeah, that's good. Anything about eternal life strike you? I mean, we didn't hear that explicitly in that prayer, but any, any, 
you have, have a sense of this meal being related to eternal life in some way? No. Not now and forever. Yeah, that, that's in there. But what were you saying, Susan? It says, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. It does say it explicitly in the prayer. Nicely done. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one, the, this, is, this is one of the uh, dominical sacraments, the two dominical sacraments, the ones given by Jesus, baptism and Eucharist, where if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you need to do this. That's, I mean, that's how the church has interpreted it. A more generous, loving interpretation might be baptized people who participate in Eucharist get eternal life. Oh, <laughs> that's a pretty cool thing. So it's not, I mean, it is bringing Jesus into the present, and it is making us the body, and it's also affirming, assuring, giving us access to this forever, which is... Astonishing, I think. And I think it's liminal space because it's a moment in which we participate in the way Jesus has mm. mm. Yeah, that's wonderful too. That it isn't the the, the um, sort of the time travel involved in this isn't just past into present. It's present into future or present into current beyond what we can understand or something like that. However, you want to imagine time and space, but that, yeah, we are gathered with St. Polycarp and St. Peter and St. Andrew and I mean, all the folks who have gone before and all the folks who will be, right? All the, and all the saints and angels. Yes, yes, right. Okay, well, that's, that's probably enough of that. Um, yeah, no big deal. No, I'm just conscious of the time. Um, so this comes from something, right? That this is not simply the tradition of the church handed down over the centuries. I mean, it is that, but that comes from something. And where it comes is from, whoops, I took two, from the Gospels initially. So what I'm giving you is a, a fun thing. Uh, this is a Gospel parallel. Um, of the synoptics of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so that we can see what the different tellings of the story say. How, how do they tell the story? And I just, I'm, this is mostly just, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, but, but they're also, if we look at the, if we look at the one from Luke particularly, um, in the right hand column, it makes a connection with what this class is focusing on is the, the connection between the Passover and the Seder and the celebration of Eucharist. So if we look at that one, Jesus is saying to the disciples on that last night, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So what this tells you in the, the, the way the page is designed in the Gospel Parallels is that that doesn't show up in Matthew and Mark. It's just in, it's just in Luke. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And this will sound familiar. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is, pour this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Is there anything about that telling of the story that strikes you as a little odd or surprising? Luke is very democratic. Yeah, yeah. So how do, what, what do you see in there that says that? Well, the idea that he gave the bread to the people to give to each other. Hmm. That first paragraph to me speaks to the democratic mind of the Greeks. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Take this and divide it among yourselves. Yeah. 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 Okay. There's a free will action there. That it probably, yeah, it does. It would connect with the, with the Greeks that way. That's good. Anything else strike you as a little 
different about Luke's telling? There's an implication here of partaking of it again in the future, like when the, when the kingdom comes. Yeah, that's true. Now, the others, in fairness, the others say that too. When I, I will drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom or in the kingdom of God. But yeah, it's it's it comes first. It's yeah. yeah, it's placed differently. And it, sorry, it was after supper. It was after supper. What was after supper? The giving of the cup. Luke. Does it say that? It says, and up. he did the same with the cup after supper. Oh, oh, there it is. Yeah. Yes. Although, no, it says, it's, well, it says that in some of the other two, but that's okay. But yes, it's after supper. I guess what I'm what I'm searching for, sorry, is that in, in Luke, the cup happens twice. Yeah. And we're so accustomed to hearing it the way we hear it in the narrative of the institution that we don't even hear it. <laughs> But but in Luke, Jesus is giving his friends a cup and saying, "Take this and divide it among yourselves. This will be the last time I celebrate the Passover with you." So that says a couple of important things. One, this is explicitly a Passover meal from Luke's perspective, and that's another rabbit hole you could go down because a lot of other scholars think, "No, it wasn't a Passover." In fact, John locates what we would call the Last Supper the night before Passover and not on Passover. So okay, but. At least Luke is saying it's on Passover. So it's the Passover Seder. So, so he's, he's sharing wine, and then he's sharing bread, and then he's sharing wine again. Which I don't know that that has particular theological impact for us, but it's interesting where it comes from. Because if remember the videos about the Seder? Now, I, have to say, I am no expert in Judaism or Seder meals. I, this is not... Not my thing, but I did remember from one of those videos Jen showed, there are somewhere between four and six cups of wine that are shared at a Seder, depending on whose Seder, whose version of it you're, you're following. Um, and so if, if you know that, it makes a little more sense that Luke has them drinking wine and eating bread and drinking wine again as if it didn't take the first time or something. It's not, it's not that. It's that the Seder includes at least four opportunities to do that. And and the one, um, you know, where is this? Is it the second? Yeah. The, the second cup um, passed around is the, the cup of deliverance. So the cup symbolizing the deliverance of people, of the people out of slavery and out of the clutches of death, right? And as that video noted, it is sipped by all, as opposed to people having a drink of their, you know, from each other, from, from their own wine glass. The, the, the second cup of wine is passed around, which might sound familiar, <laughs> right? I mean, we could have, we could have, we could do, and kind of do in there, actually, a Eucharist where everybody has their own cup. I mean, there's nothing explicitly heretical about that, I don't think, although some liturgical purists would probably argue there, there might be because it's supposed to be, you know, the cup with Jesus in it, right? We, we extrapolate that a little bit and say, well, if you have a little cup that's on that table, it probably gets covered by this. Of course, that raises all kinds of questions about how far do you have to, you know, how, how close does it have to be, right? So if... Sorry, what? The perimeter. the perimeter of consecration, yes. So if it's, you know, well, actually, it's a valid question. If it's in the next room and I do this, does that count? Okay, maybe that does. If you're home and you have a glass of wine and you're watching on the live stream and I do this, does your wine at home become consecrated? Well, does it? I mean, that's... Well, during COVID in a lot of people's houses, we, we thought so. But I, at least in our diocese, we, we, the bishop, decided, nope, you may not do that. We were told very explicitly, do not tell your people that they can have bread and wine in their houses that you consecrate that way. I'm not seeing it here, but uh, I have a problematic, problematic sort of Eucharistic interpretation to share. 
Oh, good. Um, I don't know if it's like the words of institution that I grew up with or wh where it comes from, but for as often as you do these things, do so in remembrance of me. Where yes. does that come from? The, for as often as you do this. Yeah. Okay, because my problematic opinion is that Jesus didn't intend for this to be a one-time ceremonial event or even one that is over... Uh, that that one particular individual oversees or or facilitates, but that every time we eat and drink, we do so in in that covenant of Christ. In fact, this is about the wine. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Yeah, that's um, what you, what's in your. So head. I would say it goes beyond the room or even the individual consecrating it, and that it's just always and so, everywhere. So any time the body of Christ is gathered and we share a glass of wine, I mean, you're, the, the logical conclusion of what you're saying is we're, we're having Eucharist, whether we're officially having Eucharist or not. Yeah, I have trouble discerning where it stops. <clears throat> because even beyond wine and bread, you know, Jesus is taking the most, uh, just the most common thing. Yes. Yes. And making them sacred. And yes. so the grain of the field and the fruit of the vine, the simplest things that everyone takes to be in the flesh, makes them Jesus, brings them to Christ, is putting them at the table. And so it's not a ceremonial reality. It is the fundamental reality. Anyone that eats and anyone that drinks is celebrating the Eucharist is my problematic. Even if it's not, even if they're not aware that it's Jesus. I think, I think Jesus is asking us to remember, but that we are. Remembering is coming back to the understanding that fundamentally you are Jesus. You are a member. Joshua, this is bordering dangerously close to Gnosticism, which may be acceptable if. <laughs> yeah, so what, what you've said is not, you know, Christian teaching. Right. That's fine. That's cool. Um, it's just good to know what is what is and what isn't. But it, oh, I had a thought that just went right out of my head. Um, shoot, it'll come back. Well, the, the, the thought I'm taking from what you're saying is, that we are all in Christ. Yes. And if we will remember when we are eating, there's there's a special awareness or connection about that. Yeah. Um, and so that <clears throat> I, w I once had a priest say, uh, he was told the story of him teaching, um, and a bunch of little boys and girls came up, and one, one uh, little boy said, why are you holy? Talking to him as a priest. And he said, I'm, I'm holy in order to remind you that you are holy. And so, in a sense, the same deal would be the Eucharist is a meal to remind us that all of our eating together can be a reminder of <coughs> Christ's providence and love. That's more of a teaching, but it... Yeah, but yeah. But, it, but it it's certainly... It's a way of thinking. It's a, it's a way of thinking. Yeah. And... Um, um, as the centuries go on and as the church becomes the church as opposed to a group of folks who are gathering to have dinner together or have a Seder together and remember that Jesus fulfilled God's liberating promises, I mean, from their perspective, as the way branches off into it's something different from Second Temple Judaism, they, they, they could do that without having to worry about it. As, as time goes on, the church as the institution has to figure out how do we differentiate between people just getting together to have pie and pizza and people getting together to bring Jesus into their, their midst. And so among the ways that the church does that is, or did that, does that, um, is, is by saying, sorry? Eucharistic prayer, right? Is Eucharistic prayer, yeah. No, is, is saying that if, it, doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be a particular form because, I mean, the, even the rubrics say you can make this stuff up. It does, though, have to have form and matter and intention. 
So there has to be a right. You, you could have written it yourself, but there has to be some, there has to be a form that you're following to ask God to do this work of remembering. There has to be actually bread and wine. Of some, it could be a hot dog bun, but I mean, there has to be something. It could be a pizza crust. That'd be cool. Um, but you can't, you can't have the empty plate and have Eucharist. And you have to intend to do it. So this is how the seminarians get around all the um, uh, simulations of sacramental work that we do in order to learn how to do this stuff. We, we have simulations of Eucharist instead of Eucharist. We do all the same things, but the intention is not to consecrate the bread and the wine. The intention is to train the seminarians how to do this. So even though it sounds and looks just like you've had Eucharist, made Eucharist, you officially, in the eyes of the church, haven't. Now the seminarians will quibble about that because we sure felt like it was real. <laughs> you know? And I kind of think it was, but that's a whole other <laughs> This has always been, uh, I talked to Jerry about this too. Am I on? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's, it's just going on the live stream. Is that, like in the Methodist Church, they say we're not in this much detail, but they say do this in remembrance of me, and they have the wine and they have the bread. Right. And therefore. How about grape juice? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah it'd be or grape wine. Juice instead. But nonetheless, I think their intent their remembrance is the same. Yes. Without as much Absolutely. Of yeah. detail. And therefore, the fact that it's blessed, and in the Episcopal Church, we believe that it is in some way changed. Right. Okay, some Protestant churches, Methodist being one, I don't think they believe, if I'm correct, that it's in any way changed. It's just simply the bread and the, it's a bread and it's a wine or it's a grape juice. Mm -hmm. But they're still doing it in remembrance. Absolutely. And perhaps the same kind of theology of bringing us together and so forth. Very similar. So I've always yeah. struggled a little bit about the importance or the, I want to say the mystery yeah. of the blessing that the priests give, which makes it different. And it wasn't made different by other churches. Is it still... I think, is it just a matter of how you want to believe it? You know? I <clears throat> here. Um, just to follow you, I grew up a Lutheran. Yeah, yeah. And in a Lutheran church, you never had it before you were confirmed, which was 14, 15. Right. And then after that, we had it only once a month. Right. So, uh, you know, I listen to all of this, and I'm still kind of thinking about, what was it wrong that we only had it once a month? And I well, mean, if, if it was, the Episcopalians were wrong too, because yeah. that's, that's what we were doing yeah, at the same to time. Yeah, oh, okay. that's, uh, yeah. No, that we we yes, until until the 1979 prayer book. That's that was our practice too. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Really? That was yeah. a huge change with the yeah. 79 prayer book. What did you get? Having Eucharist every week. Oh, okay. That's fine. No, I was just asking. He didn't hear it online. I didn't hear it. <laughs> so it's a great question. If you if you don't if you're in a, if you're in a church tradition that doesn't see real presence happening out of the act of consecration, is Jesus actually there? Yes. I'd say so, but I don't know. I don't know what the Methodist local Methodist bishop would say. I don't actually know what the Methodist theology of presence is. How do you know what Jesus isn't? Well, yeah, that's, and there, and there you get, exactly, yeah, exactly, how do you know when Jesus is not there, um, and isn't he always? So, to what degree are we wrapping ourselves up, you know, unnecessarily in differentiations about theology? A whole lot, I would say. Um, to me, if, if the community, if the gathered community is seeing itself as the body of Christ and inviting the Holy Spirit to bind them together, and inviting God to make this a meal in which Jesus is in, in, present, whether it's physically or spiritually, oh, who cares? I mean, sorry, but I mean, you know, it does, that is not 
that is not worth having any serious disagreement over, in my opinion. It, it's, to, to me, the, the doctrine of real presence for us is valuable only because it makes us think and be aware that our prayers and the Holy Spirit being, um, you know, acting based on our prayers, um, that, that something different happens here. It, it's an outward and visible sign of that difference, that it isn't simply bread after those prayers have been said. Now, whether you want to, how far you want to go with that, I don't know that that matters so much. I mean, I grew up in the Disciples of Christ, and we had communion every Sunday, but it was an ordinance. It wasn't a sacrament. There you go. Okay. So it was an act of obedience We'd done because commanded. Because Jesus said so, yeah. And so, and then I went to seminary and learned all the different ways of understanding it. <clears throat> and, I, and I was going to a Lutheran school, and there was consubstantiation as the way that turned into the body and blood. And, of course, Roman Catholics is transubstantiation. And I just couldn't go with any of those. And when I learned that in the Episcopal Church, we did not try to explain right. how it happened, that it was a mystery of the church, I said, that's where I belong. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I like the mystery, but I like the fact that we don't have to nail everything down. Yeah. We don't have to nail everything down. It doesn't have to be right or wrong. It gets to simply be. And and you will find clergy and theologians in the Episcopal Church, you know, everywhere from this is virtually cons I mean transubstantiation to folks who are virtually Presbyterians in their understanding of this is simply a memorial with some good prayers said over the bread. You know, and there's a wide range. In which real real presence abides across that. I mean, I, I would say. At least. I'm trying to keep myself from coughing, so forgive the um, cough drop. Okay, so in a little bit of time we have left. Might be interesting to think about looking at you know the Passover Seder and Last Supper slash Eucharist. What, where are their resonances? Where, what, do you, what do you see as commonalities in what the Seder, the Passover Seder, is evoking? You know, that living memory of God's action and what Eucharist is evoking in living memory of God's action. How, what do they share? Being saved. Being saved. That's a great way to frame it. Maybe... maybe uh, Means slightly different things well, yeah, on the two in the two yeah, tables, yeah. but but salvation, you know, yeah. So so being saved is what she said. Whether that's being saved from, um, yeah, that well, Pharaoh's oppression and slavery and the angel of death and the waters of the Red Sea and all the things that might have killed them. Um, being saved from from all of that as a as a token of the special relationship between God and the people of Israel, a token of a, a representation of the covenant um, that then Moses receives explicitly. Um, okay, yeah, and, and and then for us being so, what what does it mean then for us to be saved? There's a loaded question. One of, one of those one of those things you could go off on forever, but you know we in Christianity, we, in our tradition, we often end up sort of mocking the people who want to run around, you know, talking about, are you saved? Are you saved? Well, what does it mean to be saved for us? What do you think? It means to have a relationship with Jesus, I think, and okay. therefore, he's, and the Holy Spirit is in you, and you have eternity to look forward to. And you have eternity to look forward to. That kind of seems like an important yeah. component of salvation for us. Yeah. What, anybody else? What salvation means for you? Being yes, saved? Sure I'm, you're just not sure yet. <laughs> That's a great answer. Yeah, you're honest. You're honest. I mean, when I was growing up, yeah. I, all the 
you know, Springfield, Missouri, oh, there are all these billboards, you know, church billboards, uh, many of them saying something along the lines of, Jesus saves, and I always thought, from what? <laughs> no, really, I mean, as an honest-to-God question, what is it he's saving us from? I mean, for me, it's freedom from fear. Okay. Freedom from fear. Freedom from death, in Debbie's perspective. You know, to me, I think if we, we look at it as the opposite of sin, right? So if sin is separation from God, it's, it's huh. union with God, and with, within that, a conversion of life in this lifetime that moves toward holiness. You sure you're not orthodox? <laughs> <laughs> I think you are orthodox, yeah. We're right back to divinization, actually. And all those things are true, right? I mean, and there are 20 other answers that... Would, uh, to me, would be would be true as well, but but yeah. So it both of those celebrations are bringing into living memory God's saving action. It's just a matter of how you see being saved. Um, I think that's kind of cool. What, and what else? What else do you see as common between the Passover Seder and the Last Supper or Eucharist? Anything else strike you? The same foods are served at, at the Last Supper all the time, the same ones, and the same ones are served at the Seder. That's a traditional. So there are traditional foods that are part of these celebrations, absolutely, and very specific foods in, in, in Judaism for the Seder, that are many more than what we just have bread and wine. They've got several things on the plate, as we saw in the videos. Um, yeah, which and, and there are a couple of things interesting about that to me. Um, one, one is we're, we're, we're traveling through a very, we're doing time travel through a different sense than usual. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're using taste, we're using food as, as the vehicle of time travel, so to speak, which I think is really kind of cool. Um, but there are also commonalities in those foods, right? Both are using bread and wine. So that's that's significant, I think. Um, there's also a common. This is this is about food and about more than food. There's also commonality about the lamb, right? Mm -hmm. So a component of the seder is the the lamb that is sacrificed, the lamb that is that is killed. That in in the story, the blood is used to paint the doorposts and you know let the angel of death know not to stop there and. And, and in the in the telling of the story or the the, the 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 ritualization of the story for later, you know, each household is supposed to to take a lamb and <clears throat> um, kill it and cook it, and that that's that's a part of the that's a, a big part of the of the the Passover celebration that then is translated into you you're going to have lamb on your plate at a seder. There's going there's going to be you know lamb lamb on that plate. How how does that resonate for us? Do you see any connections about lamb for us? Easter meals include lamb. A lot of Easter meals do include lamb. Yes, that probably hearkening back to, to to that. What what else? The Lamb of God, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Yeah, yeah, the sense of Jesus being the sacrificial lamb once and for all. That, that there isn't the need for sacrifice. I mean, the, the Christian reading of this would say Jesus is the, the final sacrifice. You don't need to keep doing this anymore. You know, tem temple worship isn't necessary or uh, it's been replaced by Jesus as the, the one sacrifice that takes away sin. Um, and, and so, though we don't have lamb on our plate, in a sense, you could argue maybe we have lamb on our plate. And, and we drink the blood of the lamb in that? Yeah, 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 I think that works. Um, let's see, where else was I going with this? Oh, this one just struck me. I mean, this is really obvious, but I just thought it was worth raising up. Out of the, out of the video about the Seder, somebody in one of those videos made the point that um, the Passover is a call, part, part of the meaning of the Passover, is a call to be involved in the welfare of your neighbor. 
the, the communitarian sort of sense of Passover. This isn't just something that I do. It isn't even just something that my family does. It's something that the people of God are doing on that night together and that they're invested in one another and invested in the community in which God's put them and all that. And I just thought that's, you know, it's not, um, it's not exactly the same thing as a theology of the body of Christ, of course, but it's, it's a similar sort of sense of we're not whole without each other. The community is not whole without the rest of the community. If one suffers, all suffer. Actually, I think that was reading from the Daily Office today um, out of 1 Corinthians about you know, one, one part of the body is suffering and all parts of the body are suffering. So, uh, The community celebrating the Seder is not just um, right. the Jewish community. No. It's, it's very common and expected to bring in neighbors of other faiths um, to be part of this yeah. celebration. Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. So that's, that raises an interesting theological question for us. I mean, we, we are encouraged to bring people to church. We are encouraged to bring people to our celebration of God's presence among us and in us and through us. And if that's the case, are those strangers welcome to receive communion? They are in St. Andrews, yes. <laughs> In the Catholic Church, you're not. Um, in the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, you're not. <laughs> Early on in the Episcopal Church, yeah. you were not allowed to receive communion until you were confirmed, and there was an age qualification. And we, we've, we've grown to the place, and I, I'm well aware that John, particularly on, on Sunday morning, says we're all invited to this Lord's table. But that's but, not but what I'm cheating just a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. Because technically, um, you're supposed to be a, a, a member of the faith. But and, I, and what would that be? I mean, you, obviously, what, yeah. what's the mark of that? Yeah. What's, what's, what's the, what is it that you have to be officially to receive communion? Well, a baptized yeah. person, yeah. Baptized. And, and I am so glad because, and even... We, we allow, and, and you see the little kids come up and receive, and they have no more knowledge of what they're doing, except we're setting a good example for them, and they will learn as the time goes on. So. Yeah. Maybe it becomes a way of life. Right. Nice. Yes. So I used to work at a different church, and they yeah, used... Yeah, yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, very much. Uh, so the um, person who frequently consecrated the Eucharist, was a lay, licensed Eucharistic minister, <laughs> something along those lines. And the moment that she became aware of Josh, who at the time probably identified more Buddhist than Christian, was taking the Eucharist as all were invited to take, she added, she added a caveat to the end of the Eucharistic prayer saying, while this is a decidedly Christian event, all are welcome oh, to the really? table. And that, so it went that way. I thought the story was going to go a different direction. <laughs> well, I just remember, I just remember how that felt. And I think that and you how, remember, how did that feel? How does that feel? Well, it's just like, oh, exclusivity. Like, you know, just like, this isn't really for me. Because, I mean, it's, I don't know about you all, but I, I am constantly wrestling with what it means to be welcome to the table. Yeah. But I know that by going to the table, I am refreshing my memory and my commitment to this covenant. Yep. So, and I think that's what Jesus intended. I mean, when I read the story, that's what stands out to me personally. And I think I, the number of people that I talk to and can sense the harm done and have a relationship with them because they have had that same experience in a myriad of different ways, speaks to what I think Jesus is really trying to do, which is invite everyone. And in several of these comparative gospels, he says, for you and for everyone, not all of them, but in yeah, several but, of them. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I just, 
that's a head scratcher for me. But I could tell you what it's like to not feel welcome at the table. And that's a very, that doesn't feel very Christ centered. What, what, what yeah. did she add? While this is a decidedly Christian event, all are welcome. You know, it's like, it's Southern for, this is not for you, but. <laughs> But a, a very, a very kind way of saying you're not really as welcome as the rest of us. Some animals are more equal than others. Yeah. But doesn't identity also matter? What do you mean by that? Well, to say that this is a decidedly Christian event is to be clear about identity, and then to say, and all are welcome is to talk about the nature of the identity, which is, we welcome everybody. How do you decide to be Christian? How do you decide to be Christian? I think it's a question that deserves a lot of chewing, but I know, as we have discussed numerous times, we keep coming back to intent. And when I... My interpretation of the intent of that statement isn't to say we identify as Christians and you can too. It's we identify as Christians and you should. I, I, th I think that depends upon what your interpretation is. That Because I could see that in, in kind of the way that John does, that it is an open invitation. Right. But it, again, given our experience and what our background is, affects how we hear and how we understand. But I could, I could see that as a welcoming invitation. But it didn't feel that way to you. No, it didn't. Well, it didn't. Yeah. I think it's all to do with it was added. That it was added. It was added. Oh, we just became aware that someone from outside of the flock oh. is here. So we need to name. We need that. to put a caveat on this. Yeah. Yeah. And you wonder what was behind that, right? What What was? I mean, you all had been there. Why all of a sudden was it important to say that in that pastor's mind? I mean, you wonder. Yeah. The whole thing. What yeah. What was that? Yeah, I think that's right. Your Facebook, Harrison. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm I'm reading everybody's stuff all the time, and I'm not going to let you comment. No, that is not true. That's not true. <laughs> Well, yep. we're so loving, we're willing to have a Facebook heretic eat at our table. <laughs> Even though we are just Even, yes. <laughs> Even though we know the truth. Okay, we need to get going. Um, no, 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 not because of that. I, I, one, one thing I do, I do think it'd be interesting to, to chew on, and if anybody wants to think, just speak out loud about this, please do. The, the other thing that's huge connecting those remembrance celebrations is the notion of covenant. I mean, it's so big and obvious that it kind of goes without saying, but it shouldn't go without saying because it's really important. And I don't know that we know what that means, just as we throw these words around a lot. But, you know, there is old covenant and new covenant, right? So um, for the people of Israel having their their the current people of, of, of Judaism having their, their seders, their Passover seders, you know, they're honoring the covenant that God made with um, their, their spiritual forebears and with Moses and with all of them across time. And, you know, God's covenant community there as a, as a token of holiness um, for the rest of creation to, to emulate Something, something like that. I mean, I'm not trying to speak for Jewish people, but something like that. We, we wouldn't disagree with that, I don't think. We would say, what? what? What is, yeah, yes and. So what is this new covenant that we talk about? This is the new covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. What is that new covenant? I don't know if this answers that directly, but for the first time tonight, I was thinking about, you know, in the Levitical Code, the, the Israelites were forbidden from partaking of blood. They had to abstain from it. And the whole of the New Covenant is here, drinking my blood. And I just yeah. find that negation fascinating. That's, I hadn't thought about that either. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, Christianity was, you know, pilloried as cannibalism yes. in the early it's days. Shocking. Yeah. If you, if you stop and think about it, yeah, that's right. Like, that's a shocking thing to say. That was probably very jarring in dinner. <laughs> well, oh, we're all having such a nice time. Here, drink my blood. Yeah, right. <laughs> what? Well, and, and in John's Gospel, it, it's... No, um, you don't need a nice microphone for him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be equitable. <laughs> um, He's I mean, sure. in, in John, some of the disciples leave when he's talking about that. When he starts talking about you, you, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, and a bunch of folks take off. Yeah, and and he turns, and Jesus turns to you know Peter and the, the twelve or whoever, and says, "Are you all going to go too?" And Peter says, "Where else will we go?" It's a great, it's a great line. I, I love that. Um, anybody have a sense of what the new covenant is? What, what is it we're receiving out of that new covenant, and what is it that we're giving? I mean, a covenant is. An agreement between two parties. We're being given eternal life. That's a big one. I think we're given a new way of approaching life. Um, yeah. It's, and I think it's really, I think the, one of the problems we have in this day and age is that we equate covenant and contract, and they're very different. Right. True. This is not a contract. Yeah. So it's it's very flexible. There's a lot of flexibility to it. Because it's it, I think of a covenant as more like a dance. Like what? A dance. Especially when my wife and I dance. <laughs> because she keeps dancing with me even though I'm a goofball at it and I might step on her toes and we just make the adjustments and we keep dancing because we're committed to keep dancing. <laughs> okay, that's where we're ending. That's perfect. <laughs> Our covenant with the Almighty is to keep dancing. Thank you for showing up. That's perfect. Nicely done. Yes, and go have more pie. That's right.